Hi, uh, my name is Stephanie Spencer. I am friends with the lovely Sarah Wilhelm Garbers and we were chatting uh, last week about some things and she said, hey, how about bringing that to a Monday meditation? And I thought that was a great idea. So um, I know some people at Colonial through um, scripture circles. I work with 40 Orchards and we do that um, once a month. And um, what we do there is we dig into um, the context of passages and Hebrew and have conversations and wrestle through all sorts of ideas of scripture. And so that's um, really- So Sarah and I were outside and we were talking about hope and um, really the difference between uh, ancient Hebrew thoughts about hope and how we often understand it here in the modern world and in English. And I think here, um, if I look at people's hashtags or just how people talk about hope, it's very much a feeling. Um, and in Hebrew, it's very much an action. Um, so the first use of the word hope, which is tikva in Hebrew, is uh, in the beginning of the book of Joshua. And Joshua is leading people into the promised land that they've waited hundreds of years to go into. And um, some spies encounter a woman named Rahab, uh, who is a prostitute. She's been an oppressed person in the city that she lives in. And she sees something in these Hebrews that she encounters, and she asks to be a part of what they're doing. She asks to be a part of the freedom that they're bringing. And they say, yes, you and your family can have that freedom with us, but you have to signal to us um, on the day that we come into your city where you are. And they invite her to signal that by hanging a red cord out her window. Um, and the name of that red cord is a tikva. So she literally hangs hope out her window. Um, and that hope is a picture of the fact that she believes that her life doesn't have to be the same as what it was. That she is willing to take an action that risks everything. A red cord out a window is visible to all of her neighbors, but she says, I believe that the future can be different than my past, and I wanna be a part of what's happening here even at that risk. Um, and when you go back to the verb form, tikva is a noun. Uh, when you go back to the verb form of that, it's the word kava. And kava is first used in Genesis 1. We often go back to Genesis 1 in scripture circles. And um, the very beginning of day three. Um, day three is often thought of as the day that uh, the Lord creates plant life. And there's a beautiful story of that that starts in verse 11. But the beginning of day three is actually in verse nine. And there's this whole segment of the day that's before the plants come, before life starts to come onto the scene of creation. And in this part of the day, God separates water from land and creates dry earth and he creates seas. And all of the life that is gonna come in the future days of creation is birthed from those seas and from that dry land. When you go into the, the section on plants, it says, let the earth spring forth. Even when it goes to animals, God says, let the earth spring forth. Well, that earth is created when the seas are gathered. And that word for the gathering of seas is kava. It is the first use of that word hope. It can mean hope, it can be weight, mean weight, it can mean gather. And the idea of it there is to say, there is an action to be taken now that will be the action that will enable life to come later. And God pauses in the middle of that day as if to say, don't miss that. Don't miss that I am pausing in the middle. We think of it creation at the end of the day, God says, oh, the day was good. In the middle of day three, God says it's good. He says it's tov, good when that gathering of water happens before the life comes because that hope in and of itself regardless of what comes next is worthwhile it is a good action to take and i when we follow that trajectory forward i think of how the word kava hope wait is used in isaiah 40 to people who are in exile and it says those who wait hope on the lord will renew their strength and I also think of the way it's used in the book of Jeremiah. And I especially think of that one when I'm thinking about our present day. So Jeremiah 29, 11, it's graduation season. It might be something that you put on a graduation card. Um, that famous verse of, um, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for a hope and a future. The thing about that verse and the context of that word hope is Jeremiah is speaking to people who are in exile and he's answering their question of what do we do here? We are away from the promised land. We are away from the temple where we worship God. Everything in our life has been upended and shifted. Is God even with us here? And what Jeremiah says to them is, yes, 
God is with you here, and your role to play here in exile is to look to the shalom of the city that you are in, because in its shalom, in its peace, you will have peace. And as they do that, the hope he's talking about isn't actually for them. And this is something that we just have such a hard time picturing in the modern Western world, is generational goodness. The hope he's talking about there is not saying to the people, if you seek the shalom of the city you're living in, all of your life will be great. Actually, the people he's speaking, speaking to will die in exile. They will not return to the land. Their grandchildren will be the ones to return to the land. And what he is saying to them is live in such a way now that your grandchildren will know how to return to the promise, that your grandchildren will know that God is good, that your grandchildren will know how to live in peace, how to bring that goodness to others that we were always meant to bring to others. And you teach that to them through the way that you live now, even though you might never see the fruit of that action. That is what hope is. And I think about all of the things happening in our world today and how much of it feels outside of our control and what can we do. And I wonder what Jeremiah would say to us, what Jeremiah would say about living into the kind of hope of gathered water, waters that says life might come in the future from this action that I can take now. And even if it doesn't happen in my lifetime, it is worth taking that action now. It is worth the good that can come to do this hard work now. Because that is not an easy call in Jeremiah to live towards the peace of those who have harmed them. But it's about a future that is different. It is about that future and that hope that lives for a reconciled community of people, that lives towards peace and wholeness for all and says, I am willing to do hard work now to move that forward. And each generation, if we can move that forward, then we are living into that idea of hope. And when I think of Rahab, I wonder how she actually felt hanging that cord out her window, because it might not have felt the kind of feeling that we think about with hope. She might have felt scared. She might have felt angry. She might have felt really sad about all that she was losing in order to move towards something new. But she took that action for the sake of herself, but also for the sake of those she loved. And I wonder, friends, if we can live into that kind of hope, if we can ask, what hard thing can I do now? What kind of waters can I gather so that there is life that can spring forth from it? Even if that is difficult for me, do I have a role to play?